This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to this week's episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Strozinski. On today's show, where is Jade Cargill going? Is she WWE bound? A ton of releases from WWE. Also, WWE just signed a monster television deal moving SmackDown. We're going to tell you where. We're going to get into all of that. You're going to want to stick around, as well as we're going to break down what took place on Dynamite, Rampage. We're going to take a look at Raw and SmackDown Help me digest it all and tear it all apart and discuss it with you is the one, the only. He is the Doc John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Big week of wrestling. You had four hours of professional wrestling on a Friday. That's crazy with SmackDown and then a supersized Rampage. Lots to get into. Man, it was a crazy week for WWE. And yeah, it kind of stinks too because you would think that someone would say, well, look, we're about to announce a big deal here. Why would we combine that with the news and the release of names of those that are getting released? I feel like you could kind of maybe mix that up a little bit, wait a couple mm-hmm. weeks, but nope, not WWE. They're like, we made big money and we're cutting big money. And that's how it goes. And uh, it's unfortunate. A lot of people online cause are talking about, man, why would WWE do that? But in the end, every six months, it just kind of has been a pattern where they look at the roster and they decide who they feel like they want to move forward with. But it's just unfortunate when you juxtapose it with the fact that they just made another billion dollars that they cut talent. But you know what? To be honest, those talent that got released, they were involved in some of the worst creative in the company. So Mm -hmm. they can go anywhere and just do a lot better. I mean, really, in the end, when you're given maximum male models and that's your gig, there's no one on earth that's going to get that over. So you just take that as a sign like hell. Uh, let's just move on and let's just call it a day because if that's the creative you're giving me, I can go somewhere else and, and do a lot better. Yeah, and we're going to get into all of the names later on in the show, but I, I think you're right. When you when you kind of take a 10,000-foot a view of the people that were released, these were people who either had a really bad creative and were kind of pigeonholed and couldn't get out of that, or these were people that had issues in the back or had issues running through the company and WWE, I think just kind of went through and they purged people who either a weren't able to get over the bad creative or B. These are people who have kind of come across their desk as being a problem and they've kind of just moved them out. And like I said, we're going to get into all the names a little bit later on. Uh, I do want to kick the show off. I do want to start talking about raw. You're going to, like I said, you're going to want to stick around for all the names. We're going to kind of get into some of the reasons for a couple of the people who did get released. Uh, but I do want to get into Raw. I do want to get into SmackDown. I want to start with WWE. They've made the most news this week, um, and we've got a ton to talk about with them. But for me, I kind of felt like both Raw and SmackDown, both of these shows were kind of on autopilot. I felt like both of the shows were just kind of there. It, it really feels like at this moment in time, specifically with Raw, it feels like it's being held together by Nakamura and, and this Rollins feud. And it doesn't feel like there's there's a ton going on around it. You know, we've, we've got the Judgment Day, and the Judgment Day is a great faction, and they're kind of all over the place. They've showed up on SmackDown a couple of times. They're always on Raw, and they're, they're a main stay on Raw. They're a focal point on Raw, but they don't have a whole lot going on right now. And it really feels like this Nakamura-Rollins feud, it, it feels like it kind of hit another level this week. But it really feels like that's the only storyline that is really getting moved forward. I want to know what you think about that. Does it feel like at this moment in time, Raw is really being held together by one feud, and that's Nakamura Rollins, and that that feud kind of got amped up a little bit this week? Because I feel like after this Monday Night Raw, this was probably the most interesting this feud has been since it's kind of started. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at it. It's got the most intrigue because it's got the most behind it, and they've done a lot with it. Raw was kind of one of those shows where it's just kind of highlighted by some of the matches, but I look at it and I say, 
the intrigue is there a lot more with the Rollins feud because it's fresh and it's a continuation. Jay Uso, you get it. It's cool to see him, you know, obviously work against the, the Judgment Day. You're kind of seeing kind of the, the situation. Look, I get it that Jay Uso's presence is going to piss off everybody, but it, it's kind of been there, done that. You know what I mean? Kevin Owens mm-hmm. being upset with Jay Uso kind of kicks off the show. It's basically what you're saying, which is very true, is that a lot of the feuds that were there and implanted on that show kind of don't don't make you go, wow, absolutely knock your head off. But at the same time, it does plant more seeds. Like, okay, uh, what's going to happen? There, Obviously, I, I was intrigued a little bit by Kevin Owens calling out Cody Rhodes and saying, hey, what happened here? And boom, you, you kind of get an answer about second chances and things like that. But it, it leads to a little bit of intrigue as to how Kevin Owens is going to handle it. But I like the mm-hmm. fact that he said, hey, I don't trust this. I don't like what's happening on Raw. And that could potentially set up feuds with, with Cody down the road. Um, it could be the ultimate betrayal. Um, I thought that it was funny. He said, you know, he's one purple strand of hair away from joining the Judgment Day. I thought it was a funny line. But yeah, absolutely. I understand. I do think that the Rollins feud with Nakamura is the one that's getting highlighted. And it, they've done a good job with it. Yeah. I feel like this is the most interesting Shinsuke Nakamura has been on the main roster. Like when he came up, he was basically an entrance and everybody loved his entrance and he would get a really good pop and he had a couple good matches. But I feel like this more sadistic, cerebral, I'm messing with your mind version of Nakamura is is probably the highlight of his WWE career thus far. And on top of it, him playing off of Rollins is great because Rollins does a really good job of showing, not necessarily fear, but Rollins seems concerned, right? Rollins seems like he is he is taking this very seriously, and Rollins is kind of on edge. Rollins is kind of a little bit off kilter. Rollins' character has gone from being this, this heel to being this very flamboyant face that everybody loves. Everybody loves to sing a song to now seeming almost like he's deregulated, like he's... He's not comfortable anymore. He's been very, very comfortable for a long time. And this version of Nakamura has made him very uncomfortable. So I think it's 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 fun to watch the this contrasting style between these two. And let's say I feel like this is the best version of Shinsuke Nakamura thus far. So it's going to be really interesting to kind of see where we end up going with this story. What ends up happening? I wonder if because Nakamura has been a little bit outspoken about coming to WWE and wanting to win a championship and he just hasn't had the opportunity. He's won the NXT championship, but like he hasn't won the the, the big one. So I wonder if this is a, a, an opportunity for him to actually win this belt or if they're going to continue to roll with Rollins. I wonder if at some point Rollins does get a little bit of time off. And in, in doing so, he basically hands the belt off to, to Nakamura and Nakamura gets a bit of a run. So we'll have to wait and see. Now, you've talked about the Judgment Day quite a bit. And I think that's a good spot to pivot to. We've got Cody and Jay versus the Judgment Day. And to me, this seems like an additional storyline to kind of help Raw, right? You've kind of seen Jay go out there and he's had to work through a couple of different issues that he's caused by being with the bloodline. And now the Judgment Day is recruiting him. Judgment Day wants him to be part of their 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 faction. And Cody's like, look, I'm taking up for this guy. I'm going to side with this guy. Uh, this guy, he's a good dude. And basically, Cody has given him the, the the thumbs up, the star of approval here. How interested are you in seeing Cody and Jay take on the Judgment Day? And, and how do you see this possibly playing out? Because when I see this kind of working and unfolding, obviously the Judgment Day it consists of, of three males, one female. And I think Rhea Ripley's great. I really do believe Rhea Ripley is the leader of the Judgment Day. That being said... I'm preparing myself and I'm getting myself geared up for Cody and Jay and somebody else to take on the Judgment Day because I see it being Finn, Damian Priest, and Dominic Mysterio challenging Cody and Jay and whoever that mystery person is. How interested are you in this and do you see a third person siding with Cody and Jay? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, it has the feel of the early setup for Survivor Series as to say, okay, it's going to be... Obviously, Cody and Jay and, and, and the Judgment Day feuding. I'm not sure who the third person would be. Maybe Sami Zayn. Seems like he's an, he's a friend. 
and somebody that could uh, be somebody that would be intrigued. And then you, the wild card is how does Kevin Owens respond? If he does come down, what does he do? So I look at, I look at it and I say, it's interesting. It is intriguing. It is. See, for me, it just stinks because Cody to me feels like he needs to be involved in like top end stuff. Like mm-hmm. they, they could have went with, you know, you know, I don't know. It's tough because you can't take the belt off of Rollins right now. He's so hot, but it does feel like they could have revisited at least for a couple months the feud with Seth Rollins, even not for the title. Just, I don't know, just something different, something more than this for Cody. It just feels like it's not enough. It's not big enough. It feels like the feud really should have been Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, looking at what they're doing with Jey Uso. But right now, yeah. you're, you're in the marinating phase. You're in the planting the seeds phase, and we just want to move it along. And I get it, but we'll see who that third party is going to be. How it would play out, I just think that in the end, Early on, you probably have the Judgment Day getting over a lot, costing a lot of matches, getting involved, doing things that they're not supposed to do. But I think in this feud, it's probably best that Survivor Series ends with Cody and whoever he's teaming with win. You get him over, and you start maybe planting the seeds of uh, Damian Priest looking to get over by himself and ending the Judgment Day. Because Judgment Day is great, but what's the future? I, I just think that everybody broken apart would be great. Dominic can go on his own, be a top heel, do his thing. Uh, Priest is going to obviously feud with Rollins. I think that there's so much that they can do broken apart. I think J.D. McDonough and, and, and Finn can do their own thing. Judgment Day was great, but really what more can you do as a top heel faction than just create five new heels? Yeah, it really does kind of feel like Judgment Day is starting to stall a little bit. They're, they're kind of sputtering along. It does feel like something has to be done to reinvigorate the group or you've got to break the group up. And forever and a day, we've teased Damian Priest kind of going on his own, doing his own thing. Uh, I don't know where they end up. I, I don't I don't believe Dominic. He's a heel magnet. Or he's a heat magnet right now. Like every time he gets on the microphone, you can't even hear what he's saying because he gets drowned out by so many boos, which is fantastic. Like you've done a great job creating the ultimate heel. He should be your number one heel in your in your company right now because the guy can't get a word out to save his life. But I don't know how good he would be without Rhea Ripley. I feel like Dominic still is a little too green to go by himself. I feel like he needs to play off of Rhea a little bit more or he needs somebody else. Just kind of the way his character has been created. If they they kind of transform his character a little bit, maybe he could go solo. I, I don't necessarily want to see the Judgment Day imploded. I just need to see something change a little bit, whether you're adding J.D. McDonough uh, whether whether you've got Damian Priest leaving, I, I need a little bit more. It, to me, it just feels like it has started to get very, very stale with what we've gotten. And I, I think you're right. With Cody, for weeks now, maybe months even, he hasn't really had any good creative. He hasn't had anything. He basically comes down and he cuts his line. He's like, hey, so uh, what do you want to talk about? And the next thing you know, it'll be Dominic Mysterio interrupting. It might be somebody from the Judgment Day interrupting. It might be something else. You know, there really hasn't been anything that's been fleshed out for Cody. We've gone through, I think, two pay-per-view cycles now, and Cody hasn't had anything. So him getting paired up with Jay, like, I get it because he's the guy who supposedly brought Jay to, to Raw. I just don't know where we're going with this, and I don't know what the future holds for Cody because we're going to talk a little bit about the bloodline here. And last week, The Rock was on Pat McAfee's show and basically said that he's open to WrestleMania in Philadelphia. So are we going to get The Rock versus Roman there? Like that, That's been kind of bantied about, and that's been loosely talked about out in the open. So I'm not sure where we end up. And, and, and switching over to SmackDown – it does kind of feel like it was mailed in this week, you know? We we are getting what appears to be John Cena versus the Bloodline, and that could be quite interesting. I, I just don't know what we're going to end up doing here. So in, in in regards to it being mailed in, you let me know before we started doing the show. You were supposed to have a, a, a monster star be the main event of the show, ends up with COVID, and so now they've got to kind of adjust some plans here. Uh, why don't you share that information that you told me a little bit earlier? Yeah, that segment with John Cena and AJ Styles was supposed to feature LA Knight. And it would have made sense, too. The, the crowd would have went crazy. You have two big stars together. You get the rub from 
John Cena to L.A. Knight. But unfortunately, one of the biggest stars now in the company got COVID, which in nowadays basically means he got the flu and he's going to be back next week. But it feels like a wasted opportunity, but I don't think it's going to derail anything going on moving forward because Cena's going to be committing for the next couple months. So it just was a wasted opportunity. It stinks because every week you look forward to it. I think everybody was on television in the crowd going, oh, is LA Knight's music going to play? The the crowd was going to be ready to explode, but unfortunately it just didn't happen this week. Yeah, and, and look, when you lose a guy like that, obviously he is he's a draw. Like LA Knight is a draw. LA Knight has been basically given trash and he's turned it into gold. There's only a couple of guys who can really do that. And he's been able to do it. He's a monster star. Uh, it would have really helped put that 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 segment over the top. So he's going to be sidelined now for probably two weeks. He'll come back. Hopefully he's healthy. Hopefully there's no setbacks there. In the meantime, though, it appears that John Cena, AJ Styles versus the Bloodline was the direction that we were headed. AJ Styles, I don't know if we're writing him off a of TV. I'm not sure what we're doing because he suffered a massive beatdown at the hands of Jimmy and Solo. Could you see John Cena, because he signed a contract, and he's now taking on uh, Jimmy and Solo, but he doesn't have a tag team partner. In the meantime, I don't know if you watched Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is fantastic. Paul Heyman did not seem to really approve of this contract signing, did not really seem to approve of what was going on with Jimmy, who was very, very much so pushing his own narrative, was not sitting back and listening to what Roman wants, was not waiting on Roman, was basically going out there, taking charge, doing his own thing. And commentary made a point to emphasize that. So I think there is a storyline within the bloodline with Jimmy kind of spreading his own wings a little bit. But could you see a a spot where John Cena goes and maybe grabs The Rock and The Rock comes in to be John Cena's partner and they take on the bloodline together? Could you see that happening? Ooh, that'd be one way to intro it where uh, The Rock and Cena are getting over and then Roman Reigns has to come in and start that process. It's an interesting way of doing it, very much so. And uh, it is intriguing now. You you are getting kind of... People wondering, okay, is the blood, you know, is the bloodline? Where's this going? It really does show you that Solo is the guy of the future, man. He he just yeah, when he's, for there, sure. he's impactful. He's great and he's damaging, which is great. You believe that? Hey, when he jumps off and he takes out AJ Styles, it's serious business. And it was good to see him also get a little bit of rub working with John Cena. I just thought that you know teasing the match was interesting and stuff like that it doesn't end up happening. But the crowd was disappointed, and that's good, too, because it gives them something that they want to see. It builds up the anticipation, and when something like that happens, there's something there. But, yeah, Jimmy, look, it's just continuation. I think what people are wondering is, are we interested? How much are we interested? Um, It is adding a new layer of intrigue by adding Cena, Styles, and just more people involved in the mix. Um, But it just, I think the way in which maybe the struggles happen with WWE is the fact that you want the bloodline, but it's really not the bloodline when it doesn't have Roman Reigns. It's kind of like a rudderless ship. You have the bad, the bad dudes, but when you don't have the big dog, it doesn't make it feel. It feels like you're missing out. It's like, man, there could be something so much bigger here if the big dog was there, but he's not. So we get what we get, and and now, I think the the patience level is needed among supporters to say, look, enjoy the work of Solo, enjoy the work of Jimmy and Jay. It's new. It's not highlighted with Roman in the backdrop, but you're now seeing more opportunities for these mid carters to get to that next level. And let's see, because they are getting decent creative. They're getting decent opportunities to get the rub off of veterans. And, and I think solo for sure. Jimmy, I think is the third of the bunch and Jay is, is really over right now, obviously being the face, but Jimmy can do a lot more now to get himself um, even more hated by the crowd. For sure. And I think that's kind of what we're going to end up seeing here. I think this is going to, like I said, I feel like there's a storyline brewing within the bloodline, like another one. This is what they've done so well, with, which made this storyline for the last, what, three years, three plus years, I feel like it's been going on so good. There's been there's been overarching stories, but there's been smaller storylines within the bloodline. And I feel like that's what we're setting up for here. We're now figuring out a way to help elevate Jimmy, because like you said, Jay is completely over. Uh, Solo really feels like he is the second coming. And obviously Roman is operating at a level that he's never operated at and at a level that we haven't seen in a long time from just about anybody. 
So now how do we get this how do we get this last piece? How do we get him built up? How do we get him uh, to be more intriguing? How do we make him more of a heel? And I feel like that's kind of what we're working on here. I feel like we're trying to elevate Jimmy in all of this. It will be interesting to see how this kind of plays out. Uh, look, AJ Styles might come back and win. It might be John Cena, AJ Styles uh, versus the versus Solo and Jimmy at Payback. It could be that. That might be what we end up getting. I was just trying to figure out a way to to make things a little bit more interesting because, again, The Rock has kind of come out and said, like, hey, I'm interested in doing WrestleMania. I'm interested in doing uh, that show in Philadelphia. So we can kind of go there. There was supposed to, obviously, this was supposed to be done uh, this past year. Uh, instead, they ended up going with Cody. At some point, Cody's story has got to get finished. It feels like that is the one story that we've bookmarked and we haven't been able to complete it yet. Um, I've seen a couple of different, a couple of different uh, opinions regarding Cody. And one of those that I thought was really, really interesting was Cody never winning the championship. Cody going to WWE and never winning the championship, always falling short. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that story? Him never being able to to basically complete the story himself, always ending up uh, basically one one pinfall short of of winning the championship. <laughs> no way in hell. You'll be leaving millions of dollars on the table. The next two years, you got to maximize the return on Cody Rhodes, mm-hmm. and. Obviously, Roman's going to slow down. It's the you, you had a thousand days, bro. Three years, basically forty uh, percent chunk of the length of this podcast. Roman Reigns has been the champion. No man, I want to see Cody Rhodes with the title, shiny around his waist, walking down the ramp sometime in Detroit. You know, so I think you'll be leaving millions of dollars on the table. I mean, literally, it's a walking promotion. The guy can talk. Total package. No way does he have an entire run without the belt. And 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 for him, if if that's what he's being pitched, he's leaving millions of dollars on the table because I think him being the champion would enable him to get that credibility because he could have a two year run with all the guys he could face, Shinsuke, Seth, J- the Usos, uh everybody that he could have and, and, and cuz. Get ready. Cause you know he's going to be championing getting guys like Ricky Starks, his guys, hell, you know, I don't know why. I'm just just really on a tangent. I just keep picturing because I, I downloaded the um, Will Ospreay song. Will Ospreay needs to get his ass to WWE. He's got to be there. You know, Cody's got to be like, dude, there's so much great worldwide talent. Bring them here. Let's freshen it up. The art, the element of surprise. So I keep picturing Will Ospreay showing up at Royal Rumble and it's just in my fantasy land. But I want to see Cody feud with some of the biggest stars for the world title. I want to see the wing tip there. I mean, whoever's talking like that, take that and, Drop it in the trash. That's terrible. You cannot have a guy that's tailor. I mean, can you think of any performer that is really top end worldwide sensation legacy that didn't win the world title? I think that'd be the first in history and it would be unique, but I think it would leave millions of, uh, and, and I just think it'd be disappointing. I mean, you would get the Roman treatment where, you know, at Royal Rumble where Roman's winning the thing and, and, and the crowd's booing it. And I just think that you, I would not be anywhere near wanting to, that's why probably they won't do it. If you book Cody and Roman at Philadelphia, there's no way in hell they have the guts to do it where Roman wins it in Philadelphia. The crowd might come into the ring. Yeah, I really believe for sure. it. For sure. No, absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's going to be, it, it'll be interesting to kind of see how we transition because at some point, you got to get the belt off of Roman, you know? I mean, we talk about SmackDown feeling like it was mailed in. L.A. Knight wasn't there. Now, John Cena was there. John Cena did a good job with with the segments he was in. But Roman is such a draw. And it always feels like the SmackDowns where Roman shows up are so much better, you know? So at some point, you've already talked about him slowing down. He's already kind of hit neutral. Like, he's at this point just kind of coasting. I, I feel like... You need your champion. He doesn't have to be on TV all the time, but I'd like to see him at least two times a month. You know what I'm saying? I like to see him every now and again, and he doesn't have to wrestle. I mean, how often does Roman Reigns really wrestle? And I know it's part of his character. It's part of what they've done, and they've done a really good job of of kind of mastering that. At some point, though, he's got to show up. He's got to wrestle, and we've got to be able to see him. At this moment in time, I feel like we're going on 
almost a month now, maybe a month and a half, where we haven't seen Roman Reigns. Or maybe it's been spent since SummerSlam, if, if, if I'm correct. I'd have to go back and, and look. You know, I mean, that's been a long time. I mean, that's been, that's been almost two months that we haven't seen him. So it, it, at some point, you've got to get the belt off of him, and you've got to do something else. I, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to, how we're going to end up getting there. Um, and, and I think you're right. At, at some point, you've got to get that belt on Cody Rhodes. He's got to complete that story. I feel like it just it makes too much damn sense. Uh, was there anything else from SmackDown or from Raw that really caught your eye that you wanted to kind of drill down on and talk about? Um, no, the, I, thought, I thought obviously uh, EO Sky and Asuka. Oh my God, they got highlighted. Thankfully, yeah, give the women show. some some time. It's a great, you can match, see some sure. things. Good, good on the WWE for giving the women uh, some time, and they delivered. Yeah, absolutely. That was a fantastic match. Charlotte on the outside, uh, interfering with Bailey. We'll see kind of where that goes. Charlotte has obviously an interest in that championship belt. Uh, for me, it would be fun to see her not get it back. It's not soon anyways. Let EO have a bit of a run, and we'll kind of go from there. Uh, let's transition to AEW. I thought Dynamite was was really good. It was weird, though. We had a bit of a weird Grand Slam. As we were watching this kind of unfold, you could tell things weren't necessarily right with the John Moxley Ray Phoenix match. Ray Phoenix is now your new international champion. Again, under some strange circumstances, he won the belt. Uh, I want to get your opinion on the belt changing hands, but to kind of flesh this out a little bit and what took place. Uh, the match starts. Ray Phoenix ends up jumping over the top rope and and hitting John Moxley. It's believed at that moment in time, him jumping over the top rope at the very beginning of the match, John Moxley suffered a concussion. John Moxley continued to wrestle the entirety of the match. Ends up taking a a a package uh, pile driver, a modified package pile driver from Ray Phoenix. Doesn't look like there's anything really bad there. Rolls him over. Lays him down. One, two. Shoulder does not come up. The ref does not count three. The crowd starts to go ballistic. John Moxley says something to the referee. Ray Phoenix picks him back up, puts him in the modified pile driver again. This time looks way worse, way more impactful than the first time. It looks like John Moxley might have bumped his head on, on the mat uh, with this modified pile driver. Rolls him back over, one, two, three. Ray Phoenix is now your new international champion. Uh, turns out John Moxley did suffer a concussion. Uh, it was not from the pile drivers. It, it is reported that it happened when Ray Phoenix went over the rope and, and hit John Moxley. Not sure. Like, watching it back, I, I can't really tell what happened. Doesn't look, really look like he got his bell rung, but apparently he did. And so there was an audible call in this match. And... It was John Moxley's call to put the belt on Ray Phoenix because he was not sure where he was going to be and what was going to happen. What are your thoughts on Ray Phoenix winning the belt? What are your thoughts on on the craziness that kind of took place in this match? And, and, and how do we feel about Ray Phoenix moving forward? Does Tony Khan stick with him or does Tony Khan pivot in another direction? Because Tony Khan has a really hard time when his plans don't go according to plan. Yeah, I thought, look, I think people – Sometimes underestimate the challenge of what happens when something goes astray in the ring. I think that call was wrong by Moxley. I mean, you're not feeling it, right? You get you get your bell wrong. All you got to do is signal DQ, DQ. All they got to do is just have Ray Phoenix snap. I think that would have been interesting that it's a one-two fake and, and Phoenix just gets pissed. He goes outside of the ring, grabs something, and just starts whacking John Moxley to DQ. Everybody understands. I just think that John Moxley should have called okay, I'm not feeling it, I can't go forward, but you don't call yourself to lose a title. I mean, that that rarely happens in the world of wrestling. You just call for a Shamas finish. You know what I mean? I mean, the worst option would have been a roll-up, but in the end... You, Those are your I, favorite. Yeah, yeah, my favorite. I just think that <laughs> it, what you got to do is you, he should have kept the title, and you could have also elevated Phoenix as a... I know he's a popular individual and everything like that, but... It could have been something that could have been continued down the road of saying, you know, uh, I was close, I snapped, I lost it, I lost my cool, and and Phoenix moves forward and gets another opportunity. But now he's a champion. Actually, to be honest, the North American champion on a foreign wrestler is not a bad idea. To be honest, it, it's not horrible. But it just and here's the thing: it's crazy is that even though it happened, I think AEW needed to do a better job of selling that it was supposed to happen. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it happened. It's there. But it just kind of had the feel of like letting it be known that, oh, Moxley did this and got hurt and da 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 I think that you could have highlighted Phoenix a little bit more saying, I took him out. He had no chance of winning. You could have did a lot more um, to sell that you got a new champion. Instead, everybody kind of feels like you're Ray Phoenix. You're like, God damn it, I got a title. And everybody's like, oh, it was a fucked up, <laughs> a fucked up finish. So it's just, it was weird. Again, the way in which AEW has its wrestlers work, you just feel like someone's going to get really, really hurt really soon. Yeah, there is sometimes, don't want to take the creativity away from the guys, right? You want them to be able to go out and put on shows. Uh, like, Ray Phoenix is is amazing to watch. Like, he can do some insane aerial stuff. But sometimes things happen in matches and you just feel like somebody's on the verge of breaking a neck. Now, look, the hope is here that Tony Khan has something, right? Tony Khan, because the crowd went absolutely ballistic when Ray Phoenix won. The hope is Tony Khan realizes he has something here and gives Ray a bit of a run with this title. Helps elevate Ray. Because I think Ray Phoenix is fantastic to watch. If you've ever watched any Lucha Underground, Ray Phoenix was on that. He was incredible. Ray Phoenix is an incredible wrestler. I think you can do a lot with him here. And and look, you, you kind of pull him and Penta out of the out of the tag team uh, picture, and now you've got two two singles wrestlers who can go on and do different things. And even if you wanted to have them as a tag team, you still can because we've seen Orange Cassidy wrestle as as a tag team before uh, holding that belt. I think you've got something, and you need to really help elevate Ray Phoenix. You 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 can't do what you did when you had Willow Nightingale, who was organically over. Crowd loved her. She ends up getting the uh, the IWGP Women's Championship belt because Sasha Banks ends up uh, ends up getting hurt in their match, and you did nothing with her. You did absolutely nothing with her. You had you had all this. You like we talked about it two weeks before that match even took place. Like you need to elevate her. You need to push her. She then gets that belt. That's a look. It's a new belt, but it's a prestigious company. You need to help elevate this wrestler and get her over. Instead, you you kind of wasted it. You knew the belt wasn't going to be on her long. She was just there to hold it for a little bit. But you could have did more with her, and you did nothing with her. And you, you blew that. Don't blow this with Ray Phoenix. Ray Phoenix is legit. The crowd likes him. You need to really push him. Don't mess this up. You have all the chances and all the opportunities in the world to, to really help create another individual star. Again, very strange, weird Grand Slam. We had MJF taking on Samoa Joe. Adam Cole ends up running down from the back. It's an elevated ramp. As he runs down, he jumps off the elevated ramp. You can tell that something wasn't right when he landed because he starts limping, and he ended up limping through the entire rest of the match. Now, Adam Cole ends up helping MJF, who cheated to retain his belt. He ended up taking a, a rope and choking out Samoa Joe. Cole and MJF, are they heels? Are they faces? Are they something else? What do you see Cole and MJF as? And how do you think Cole, who is now a little bit banged up, a little bit injured, uh, was seen leaving on crutches from the hospital? He ended up having to go to the hospital that night. Uh, and his boot was base. His foot was basically in a boot. Uh, how do we see Cole's injury impacting the tag team? And what are they? Are are they just tweeners? Are they are they bad guys? Are they good guys? W- what are we doing here? <laughs> Great question. First of all, that spot with Samoa Joe taking the 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 outside portion out was scary. I was like, oh my god, please mm-hmm. don't fuck up MJF. So when he, when he picked him up, I was scared, legit scared. I was like, uh-oh, this is not good. But I look at it and I say, how the hell do you hurt yourself running down and jumping? I mean, you got to just, you got to be careful, man. I just feel like these injuries that happen like that are so unnecessary. I think that, I mean, just jump in the ring. I mean, what the hell? Slide under the ring and do your thing and, and get thrown out or whatever. But to jump like that, oh, it's terrible. Oh. It's disappointing because Adam Cole and MJF were setting up something really spectacular in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Seeing what the injury is, let's see how long it's going to keep him on the shelf. In my mind, bro, I love that Samoa Joe-MJF match. It just had the feel of a culmination of a story. I thought they told a great story with uh, uh, Samoa Joe working stiff 
And MJF, you know, when he does the kangaroo thing, it's funny. Everyone's waiting for the clothesline or, you know, the everyone. Look, it's kind of funny because he can get weird shit over. That's the sign of a star is a simple gesture gets the crowd all over it, you know. And I just thought that the match lived up to the billing. I just think that MJF, every time he, he comes down is marquee. Moving forward, it's up in the air. What should be next? That's marquee. But it has to be big time. And I just think Samoa Joe needs to be continued um, – to be somebody that's featured. He he I would just when I was watching the match, I'm like, man, it's good to see Samoa Joe healthy. And you just wish that he could have stayed healthy during his run with uh, WWE. But I thought that, man, this is perfect. And you just maybe thought this this could be something like Nakamura and Rollins, where you just continue it a little bit more with Samoa Joe now doing some sneaky things in the back. In terms of the tag team with Cole, I mean, look, in the end, I'm not heavily invested in the title that they got. All those other secondary titles just kind of feel like that. It's kind of they all feel like weird TV titles. You know, I I peek into ROH in terms of their shows, but it, it, it I think the more significant thing is the titles that AEW has. You know what I mean? The blending of it to me doesn't hit the mark for me. So I look at it like it's not a big deal. You know, whatever happens with the tag team, I'm more invested in what MJF does and and, and Samoa Joe moving forward. I gotcha. And, and it's it at times it doesn't really feel like they do a good enough job elevating the other belts, the secondary titles. Doesn't it doesn't feel like they do a good enough job of making them feel important. Uh, I can't tell you the last time I seen the the TNT Championship belt. You know what I'm saying? So it, there are times where it doesn't really feel like they're doing a good enough job. Now look, I know they have their own shows for it. They have Battle of the Belts. Uh, which is basically every secondary championship is on that card. Um, and, and look, that's a good way to try to get that talent over and try to get those belts seen a little bit more. But you got to figure out different ways to help elevate things. So uh, I think you make a really good point there where it doesn't feel as though some of those belts are as important as they should be. They almost feel as though they are props. And the moment you have a belt that's a prop, that's a fail, and you're not doing your job. Um, it's going to be interesting to kind of see how they pivot away um, from this injury, right? Like, how do they move on from Cole having this banged up foot? And I, look, I believe he just kind of rolled his ankle. It might be a sprain. So it could be one of those things where he's a little bit nicked up for a couple of weeks. Uh, so it doesn't really impede anything, doesn't really impact anything. Uh, you can kind of protect him and you can kind of write around uh, him with a storyline where he's not basically in the ring moving around. MJF can kind of carry the load for the two of them. All that being said, I, I do feel like they are, are 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 tweeners. I feel like they're 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 a very gray character. It's one of those things, whatever it takes to win. If we've got to be a face to win, we'll be a face. If we've got to be a heel, we'll be a heel. And I, again, we go back a couple of weeks, I was getting a lot of heel vibes from Adam Cole while I was getting a lot of face vibes from MJF. MJF going so low as to to put the 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 diamond ring on and there was also a a groin kick to Samoa Joe those are all heel tactics those are all heel things so i don't know where we're kind of at as far as their characters i feel like at this moment in time you've got Cole headed in the direction of a heel and you've got MJF headed in the direction of a face and they're kind of meeting in the middle on their way to these destinations so we'll see how this continues to play out Something that happened on Rampage that I thought was really interesting. Kenny Omega comes out to save Chris Jericho, who was getting decimated by the Don Callis family. Uh, Takeshita was taking a chair to Jericho. Uh, Sammy Guevara, who has now just joined Don Callis' family uh, after what took place on, on Dynamite, where uh, Sammy Guevara, Chris Jericho had a match. Sammy Guevara, at the very end of it, ends up, kneeing Jericho in the groin and throwing him down to the ground and is accompanied out of the ring by Don Callis. So this is a very big thing. This is the new story trying to move Don, moving Jericho and, and Sammy Guevara away from each other. I find it interesting that Jericho and an Omega team, again, these two guys uh, really kind of helped lay some of the foundation for AEW, uh, especially very early on. Uh, these two guys have had a bit of a history where they've not gotten along. So now you've got foes becoming friends or at least teaming together to take on Don Callis. Uh, Don Callis, very integral in setting up Omega and Jericho in Tokyo years ago. 
So I feel like this story has a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of there's a lot of layers and a lot of stuff that they can do and a lot of stuff that they can go to to really help package a very good story. I'm interested in this because I want to see where it's going to go. I want to see what they use and what they pull from for it. Um, it'll be Omega. It will be Kota Ibushi, and it will be Jericho, and they'll be taking on the Don Callis family again, Takeshita. Uh, Sammy Guevara, and I'm not sure who else is going to be inserted in there. I want to get your interest and your intrigue in this match. I'm very interested. I thought when Don Callis came to down to the ring was cool. Look, man, Takeshka, emerging star, badass, Jericho, Omega, renewing, you know, s- seeing opportunities for them to continue what they need to be doing. I thought that on Dynamite, you know, kind of seeing the way in which um, – Don Callis took advantage of Sammy Guevara and and now getting an opportunity to get in his ear was very interesting in in potentially joining the Callis family when he walked backstage and you see, um, you see everyone going, "Mm," being questioning and looking at what's going on and you say, Oh, what could be happening here? And I look at it and I say, yes, this is a match that's going to be intriguing to everybody involved. And I just look at the, at these storylines in AEW, and this is among one of the good ones that you could see, but everybody needs to be elevated. Everybody needs to come away with this, whatever happens. You know, for me, I look at the, the Callis family as something that needs to kind of be established, so maybe they get the edge in everything that goes on. I just think that potentially I wouldn't be opposed to having Takeshka run wild and do his thing and really get over and take this to the next level into championship contendership and, and doing some things as he looks to take over. So I just thought that this week for AEW – was okay in regards to having 10,000 people uh, in both shows. Did you see, uh, just by chance, that little inappropriate sign that made its way on social media in regards to MJF? No, I missed it. What was it? Uh, Go look online. I I can't repeat it here on air. You didn't know who you're going to piss off. But a dude put a sign in reference to MJF's uh, religion, and everybody that saw it said, oh, he got." I think he got removed from the stadium. And MJF said, uh, if you can't find it, he put it on his Twitter, too. He said that uh, if I had seen that sign, I would have stopped the show right then and there and been ejected for what the guy said. So MJF's drawn heat. He drew a sign that was uh, really inappropriate by a fan, which is really dumb for the the, the security to let that sign in. Yeah. But um, I, I just think that now AEW needs to capitalize a little bit more. And, Cuz, you're going to talk about it. After their, their big show, their Marquee Wembley show— it, it's okay, but not red hot heat like you need it to be. Now it's moving in a direction where maybe they're going to do more pay per views, more stuff, more content. Again, AEW has been given a lot of opportunities to take the ball and, and take, to get to the next level. They just haven't been able to get there yet. It's a little bit shaky. But women have been released, established superstars with over 1,400 career matches have been released, wild cards have been released. Now's the time for AEW to double down because you can tell a lot of great stories Mm -hmm. with a lot of talented dudes that are about to probably show up. If I'm Tony Khan, I just scratch that checkbook and I get them all, except for maybe a couple. I mean, you know, I'll I'll break it here. Shanky don't need to be wrestling on any television show anytime soon. I'm not going to tell you, you know, anything otherwise. Others are going to get that opportunity. I can't wait to hear, you know, what you think in your news and notes. For sure. We're going to get into that in one moment. I want to know what your show of the week was. I'm going to give the point to Dynamite. Yeah, absolutely. MJF handled business, man. Good main event. Good, solid wrestling match. I thought for a second when Samoa Joe did that move, maybe they would do it, but it didn't happen. I thought the kickout was great, and MJF selling everything positively. Good flow, good, good conclusion to a feud. It's Dynamite. All right, cool. So we'll give the point to Dynamite. Let's start with uh, let's start with some news and notes here. There's a lot. Now, look, I, I want to do this news and notes a little bit different. If for some reason um, I cover something and you want to stop and you want to talk about it, let's have a conversation about it because there was so much that went on this week. It was it was unreal. And I know I sent you a rundown. I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna hop and skip around with the news and notes a little bit. I'm not gonna kind of go through. Uh, top to bottom. I'm going to start with with all the releases because I feel like that is probably the most important stuff is all of the releases. Um, and I feel like there's some talking points there for us. So uh, Mustafa Ali, he was the first one to be released. He was the first guy to, to basically announce 
uh, that he was released and let go by WWE. Uh, so Ali took to Twitter to announce that he's no longer with WWE. Uh, the belief is that he was finally granted his release after multiple requests. Ali was recently on this week's episode of NXT where there was an angle setting up for him to challenge Dominic Mysterio at No Mercy on September 30th. Ali joined WWE in 2016 for the Cruiserweight Classic, which transitioned into 205 Live. In 2018, he made the jump to the main roster and got a push for WrestleMania 35 in 2019. He never made it to the show. Instead, he was sidelined with an injury, and then Kofi Mania ran wild. In January of 2022, he requested his release from WWE for the first time. He had multiple requests for his release. Uh, it was not granted. Ali returned to TV in April of that year and found himself on, in, by May, found himself on NXT. Along with Ali, WWE has released a bunch of talent. The additional cuts are Emma, Rick Boogs, Aaliyah, Elias, Riddick Moss, Top Dollar, Shelton Benjamin, Dolph Ziggler, who is probably the big name in all of this. Well, one of the biggest names in all of this. Uh, Quincy Elliott, who sounds like he was on his way out anyways. He caused a lot of problems for NXT and a lot of issues in the back. Uh, Bryson Montana, Dana Brooke, Mansoor, Mace, Dabakato, a.k.a. Commander Aziz, Shanky, uh, Ulyssa Leon, Daniel MacArthur, Kevin Venture Cortez, Alex Gray, Brooklyn Barlow, and Ikemen Jiro. Now, on Friday night, one of the bigger names to be released that was announced was Matt Riddle, who took to Twitter uh, to announce that he had been released, saying, just wanted to inform everyone that I'm no longer with WWE. Thank you for the memories and the opportunities. Also, thank you to all the fans for the support and love you gave me every time I go out to the ring. See you all soon. Now, Fightful had a report that kind of followed up to provide some more background on Riddle's release, including comments from a WWE higher up. The higher up said that Riddle had burned through too many chances during his time with the company. Now, Riddle had a long list of issues, including a sexual assault allegation from before joining WWE, a failed drug test that led to him going to rehab, the recent incident at uh, JFK International Airport where he accused a cop of sexually, a sexual assault but had himself been reported as being disorderly. Riddle signed with WWE in 2018 as a member of the NXT roster with his final match coming at September 4th, Monday Night Raw, where he and Drew McIntyre lost to the Viking Raiders. So I think out of all of this, again, a lot of people let go, a lot of big names. If you're Tony Khan, I feel like there are three guys you kind of need to go get. And one of those is Dolph Ziggler, Matt Riddle, and then Mustafa Ali. I feel like those are the three guys you need to go grab because Dolph Ziggler is Hall of Fame worthy. He is a talent like no other. That guy has been given so much crap and got so much stuff over so many times, and he puts on fantastic matches. Ali seems like he's just a, a, a really creative guy, and he's great in the ring. You can do a lot with Ali. And then Matt Riddle's just entertaining. He's a wild card, though. Like you said, there's that wild card because – he comes with baggage. So if you're willing to work through his baggage, you work through CM Punk's baggage. I feel like you can work through Matt Riddle's baggage. If you're willing to work through his baggage, I feel like that is the guy that you need to go get as well. Where are you at on those three names? And is there anybody else that you think AEW should go grab? Yeah, Boogs is on the outside. I think he's entertaining, maybe more impact mm -hmm. than AEW. Work his way up, maybe even New Japan, kind of work his way into relevancy. Just a tough situation for him because he was kind of on that spot where he was going to jump them to the mountaintop, but an injury at WrestleMania in a spot that was crazy derailed everything for him. Elias is a wild card. I think you could do a yeah. lot of crazy shit with him. Finally revealed that, was that he dude, was that Ezekiel. That was who got everything over. Yes, he did. It was just great. I think you could do a lot of good things. So, And you could spread it out over the course of the next few months. So it's going to be great to see when they debut. They're all going to AEW. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I know for sure Nick Nemeth will go over there, uh, maybe potentially Edge. You realize it's a good opportunity now maybe for AEW to kind of trim a little bit too, kind of trim down a little bit of some of the fat that you don't need. And because the, on the heels of WWE, you got to do it. Not every six months, twice a year. Once a year, you got to trim 12 people off the roster just to say, okay, cut some salary, move on and get a fresh creative. And also, too, 
guys, remember Drew McIntyre, one of the marquee individuals, Cody Rhodes, those that get cut, it's almost, it's almost like a personal challenge. Like, can you get yourself back over and come back at a different spot? And I think that's sometimes even sometimes WWE is like a little test to see, hey, what's going on? I think the character that I'm shocked still hasn't returned to WWE is Matt Cardona. He's making millions, and I think probably he loves the schedule and doing his own thing. But I just think that that's a guy that deserves his opportunity to come back. He did exactly what he was intended to do after he got released. He got himself over. Now it's a little more hardcore, and it's a little bit a little outside the box with being the deathmatch king and collecting all the belts. But I just think WWE sometimes, and I think for for I know some people are upset that the releases happened. For a guy like Dolph Ziggler, it's a good thing. Like he's gonna be like just. It's so open to do like probably 20 things that he's wanted to do for the last five years that he couldn't do. It's going to be great. He's going to have title runs. He's going to have more of a spotlight on him. A guy like Elias, much better. He's going to have more time. So sometimes people think, oh my God, they got released. It's, it's such a big deal. Sometimes getting out from the WWE family style, you know, all produced type stuff is good for certain wrestlers. And that's why it's, it's a blessing to have AEW. Because all the opportunities now that are going to take place are going to be spectacular. So let's see how Tony Khan shops over the next few months. For sure. He will basically, it's like going to a grocery store. Hello, Buy what baby. you want, get what you need. You got an open checkbook, take care of it. Right now, real fast, now, off the top of your head, any dream match scenario with any of the guys that got released? I mean, MJF and Mustafa would be fucking awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. You see MJF with all these dudes. Look, dude, I and, and this was my picture. All I kept picturing was... Uh, I think I get his name right. If it's Nick Nemeth or however you say his name, yeah, uh, his real name. That's right. Yep. You, you, you right. see that's him in Dolph. the ring yep. all black. Boom. Uh, MJF's doing a promo. There ain't nobody in the world that can handle me. I'm the best. I've gone through this roster. Boom. A, a figure with all black comes on, hooded, super kicks MJF, pulls down the hood, and it's Dolph Ziggler. Dude. Yeah. I just kept picturing what a great top end feud that could be. Uh, Edge doing his thing with Christian going forward. There's going to be so much good stuff that could happen over the next year. AEW has to capitalize because it, it kind of feels like they've kind of plateaued in, in in the in the news making department and in the like moments making department. Yeah, look, Dolph Ziggler MJF would be fantastic. Dolph Ziggler Kenny Omega would be fantastic. Basically, I just Ooh. want to see Dolph Ziggler in AEW. I want him. I want to see him in the ring. Like he is so good in the ring, and he can get anything over. Like he is fantastic. The guy's a, a wizard on the microphone as well. I want to see him in the ring. I want to see him doing what he wants to do. I want him to have that creative license to to basically book his matches and 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 do a lot of really good cool shit. Uh, I think. Uh, Mustafa Ali, like I said, he is incredibly creative. He's got a lot of really great ideas. I would love to see him in AEW. Uh, I, off the top of my head, there's not necessarily – I guess Mustafa Ali, Ray Phoenix would be a fantastic match. Like, again, we talk about guys damn near breaking their necks. It would be fantastic. Let these guys go out and just do work. It will be. It would be so much fun. Uh, so, like you said, there is so much that AEW can do right now. Like, I feel like this is the prime spot, right? You, you just kind of got through all the CM Punk stuff. You've had a couple of weeks where things have kind of calmed down. This is now where you drill down on that reset button. You go out, you get Edge. You go out, you get Dolph Ziggler. You go out, if you want, bring in Matt Riddle. You go out, you grab Mustafa Ali. If you want to add a couple of women, look, at, at WWE didn't do anything with Emma. Emma's a really good female wrestler. Emma and Soraya have a history you can bring emma in and you could do some good stuff emma before she went back to wwe was doing a lot of really good stuff and impact so if you want to fill out your women's roster go grab emma um dana brooke i think if you let her just kind of go and let her just kind of do what she wants to do instead of trying to portray her as this weird barbie doll dana brooke i think could be better dana brooke could be good uh, I feel like AEW's women's roster, I feel like she would slot in just fine. She wouldn't be at the very, very bottom. She definitely isn't going to be at the very, very top. But she could give you some good matches, give you some quality. So I, I think there's a lot that, that AEW can do and should do. And like I said, they need to hit the reset button hard and go out and grab some of these guys. Same thing with Impact. Impact can, can yes. uh, look, Impact loves doing short-term contracts with guys. Uh, so when all their when when all their non competes come up, basically in in ninety days, right? So is what uh, September right now? So September, October, November, December. So basically, 
uh, right around Christmas time, right around Christmas, all their 90-day non-competes should be up. All these guys can go and sign in. What a Christmas present for for everybody. You know what I'm saying? Impact, AEW, go pick these guys up. I, I think the one thing that really made this this bad, right? Again, it's just a bad PR look. SmackDown's moving channels. They sign a monster deal. In October of, of 2024, SmackDown will now be found on the USA Network. It's leaving Fox. So WWE and NBC Universal agreed upon a five-year deal for SmackDown. It's going to end SmackDown's run on Fox, which started in 2019. Now Raw and NXT are still up for grabs, and it does not sound like NBC is necessarily interested or interested in paying the money WWE is asking for for those two television properties. The deal is reportedly worth $1.4 billion. So you just went through and you hacked salary and you just made $1.4 billion on the side. So it's it's a bit of a bad look. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Look, WWE survives these PR nightmares all the time. Uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see what happens. They also just merged uh, with UFC to form TKO. Uh, some insight on that. It sounds like Vince is trying to sell all of his shares. He's being investigated by the feds. Uh, and it sounds like this is a way for him to to get out of this investigation with the feds. Uh, he still has creative control like we discussed last week. Uh, the, the merger was actually finalized, uh, I think it was about 12 days ago, uh, maybe 11 days ago. Uh, that the the merger was finalized, so you're you're cutting you're you're basically releasing talent after a, a multi billion dollar merger, and you're signing a 1.4 billion dollar deal uh, for a television show for one of your three properties, and then you're hacking salary. So just PR nightmares, but WWE always seems to just kind of skate by with these things. Uh, WWE purging its system but looking like it's going to bring somebody in it looks like jade cargill is gone and possibly headed to wwe is looking increasingly liking that jade cargill is out of aew and will be on her way to signing with wwe cargill's aew contract has expired and she was set to visit the wwe performance center this week uh it was confirmed that she was in orlando on monday and she was at the performance center on wednesday Speaking on Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer said, they've already started working on a creator for her. I heard that yesterday when I was asking a Brown about her. Is she, a lo- is she locked in? And she wasn't locked in, but they've been talking about her a lot. Dave Meltzer talks so weird. Um, it's always weird when i got to put his quotes in here and try to read them. Uh, it's not like this is just some minor thing to them. It's a big thing to them. She gets a focal push because the money to take it takes to get her, you have to give her a chance to get over because they're not paying what they would pay a normal person to start there. Meltzer would go on to say, I've got the impression it was main roster, not just because of the expense of bringing her in. They could put her in NXT for a little while before bringing her to the main roster. In a sense, that would make sense, but you've got to justify the money. So it sounds like she's going to WWE for a big, big uh, contract. An update on a wrestler, on a WWE star returning to the ring soon. Uh, Randy Orton has not been seen on WWE programming since May of 2022, when he and Matt Riddle lost to the Usos in an undisputed WWE Tag Team Championship match. Orton would go on to be sidelined with a serious back injury that resulted in a spinal fusion. Earlier this week, he was spotted at the WWE Performance Center. What makes this interesting is WWE has a strict rule that talent has to work out in some capacity when they're on their way to making a return. Back in early August, Fightful reported that Orton had been working out in the gym but hadn't resumed in-ring training. In an update, Fightful Sean Ross Sapp says WWE sources confirmed that Randy Orton has been seen at the Performance Center this week. Orton has said that he wants to return to the ring even though he has been advised against doing so by medical professionals. Now, WWE is going international for another pay-per-view. Early on Thursday morning, WWE announced that the Elimination Chamber 2024 will take place in Perth, Australia on February 24th, 2024. Uh, That is a big deal for Rhea Ripley, who is from Australia. Now, the question is, will this WWE superstar be on the roster then? As we know, many wrestling contracts are set to expire in the coming months going into 2024. 
The likes of Becky Lynch and Drew McIntyre are to name two. Will we add a third to that list as Sheamus's contract is set to expire in 2024 as well? Per Fightful Select, Sheamus's contract with the company is currently set to expire in 2024 with WWE sources believing his deal to be up in the first quarter or first half of the year. Now, the time frame has not been confirmed as pro wrestling contracts have a lot of caveats that could extend that time. Sheamus in his time with WWE has captured five world championships as well as a Royal Rumble win, a Money in the Bank, and a King of the Ring victory. So will Sheamus be around for the Elimination Chamber 2024? We'll have to wait and see. That's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. It was a, a pretty heavy one this week. Uh, a lot going on in the world of wrestling. Absolutely. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Lots and lots of wrestling news, and it just seems to be growing as the companies continue to grow. Impact, AEW, WWE, MLW, all the uh, uh, all the indie shows are coming up too as well. Lots of good news and notes and information in the world of professional wrestling. If you agree or disagree with anything that you heard, if you feel like angles could be looked at differently, if you think the Judgment Day should take over, it, you, you think Judgment Day should expand, let us know. Hit us up on our tw- uh, on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast. It's always fun to be part of the IWC, the Internet Wrestling Community. It's always fun to engage in banter and look at storylines and different things at, from different perspectives. And because we didn't even talk about it, Riddle could provide the ultimate wild card. You could have a world champion on your hands if you can keep his act clean and you can get him the yep. help that he needs. That's a guy that you can make a world champion in the future if you can get his act together. Something to keep an eye on. Matt Riddle, what can he become if he does get another opportunity? For the jock Adam Strozinski, I am the doc John Macaroon. Another great podcast in the books. Can't wait to join you all next week for the latest edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling podcast.